Learn more about St. Louis in two new books. Details coming up next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter, and welcome to City Corner. Uh, two new books that are just out cover some interesting topics. And uh, coming up later in the program, we're going to meet the author of Ready to Wear, which talks about St. Louis being the center of the fashion industry at one time. And that's the truth. But uh, first, we have a unique way to explore the city. Please welcome Dia Hoover. She's the author of STL Scavenger, The Ultimate a search for St. Louis's hidden treasures. Dia, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Hey, listen, it's interesting. Uh, you're, right, you're writing about St. Louis. You're not originally from here. You're from a small town, Vandalia, which is up north somewhere, right? A hundred miles northwest of St. Louis in Little Dixie, Missouri. I was actually born in Hannibal. And so that's on my birth certificate because Vandalia was too small for a hospital. But it's kind of exciting being a tour guide and having that connection. We've got a little something in common. Uh, both my parents are from here, but uh, we, I grew up a lot of different places with my parents. We moved around, but we always came to St. Louis every summer for a vacation. And uh, I understand you sort of have the same story. You weren't from St. Louis. But you, your family came once a year, so that was something that stuck in your mind, right? Always. I, I, until I was five, it was Six Flags in the zoo. And, I, and poor mom, she would always forget to look, and, and Grant's Farm is closed on Monday. So I never saw Grant's Farm until I was an adult. But you drove by a lot. I did, yes. Well, she figured out the room. She'd get the guide, and she figured out there. Um, Explain the concept of your book, STL Scavenger, because there are hints and it's a search. And how do you explain this to people? I just try to explain that it's a it's a tour on paper. So the idea is to have the area segmented into cities and neighborhoods. So there are 17 cities and neighborhoods. And I say it that way because, you know, there's there's Southampton and there's the Hill, but then there's also Edwardsville, Illinois, and there's St. Charles, and then there's Ferguson, and those are actual little cities. So it's divided into 17 areas, and then within those, there are at least 20 clues, and the clues are really threefold. You have a detail, which I didn't know what that was. That means it's a picture of something, but a very enlarged picture of a small section. So there's a detail. Then there's a, a drawing or kind of a cartoonish picture. And then there's the four line clue that I wrote. So between hmm. those three things, I hope you figure out what it is. Yeah, and, and you, you talk about that you're, you're dealing with things that are hidden in plain sight, I think is the way you put it. I am married to someone who is six foot four and I will never forget visiting him in his apartment in Little Rock and we were getting ready to go out and he pops a ceiling tile and pulls out some money. I'm like, wow, I would have never thought of that. He goes, yeah, nobody ever looks up on the refrigerator on top. So I always tell people, you know, look up, look down, look all around. <laughs> um, so we're going to look at images out of your book and I don't want you to give things away. So uh, explain to our audience what we're going to look at. These are individual pictures for two books. So these are, these are the clues. Is that right? Right. These are the detail. These are the detail. Uh, so that's the picture part of the clue. And then there's the word part of the clue. And then the, the cartoon. So if I'm using your book, can you explain to me if I um, open a page and I see this picture of a clue, do I know the area I'm looking at? What kind of hints do I have? How does that work? Yes. Yeah, so each, each, section has its own. So when you look at the bottom of a page, it'll say Edwardsville, or it'll say Alton, or it'll say Clayton. So you'll know where you are. So let's, let's say you're going to go to the farmer's market in Clayton. So then you flip open the Clayton section. And kind okay, of but then, then rhyming has something to do with it. And I know your husband helped you with this too. What, what's the rhyme uh, concept here? Well, when I was doing it, it just made more sense for it to rhyme. And then the feedback I got from my editor was the same thing. It needs to be shorter because I was trying to overtell the story. I, I had so much information. I was writing almost like Shakespeare, you know, iambic pentameter. And it's like, stop. <laughs> so then I wrote it straight. And then, then the rhyming, it just kind of came in. So yeah, that's, that's why it's a little bit of a rhyme and a fun, easy thing to do. Okay, we're going to look at some images from your work, uh, ST, from your book, excuse me, STL Scavenger. And I don't want you to tell us too much because I know these are clues and we don't want to spoil it for other people. 
So when we look at the image, just tell me what you want, or maybe you could tell me part of the rhyme or. Well, since this is the beginning, I'll, I'll do a little bit of the rhyme so that people get the feel for what it is. Because my mom said before she got the proof, she goes, well, now at least I'll know what you've been doing all this time. Oh, and I just want to say one thing before we get started. I'm looking at that background behind you. I'm a little jealous. You're not really on the beach, are you? I'm not. I'm not, but it's very soothing to me too. <laughs> so I like to have it up when I'm on Zoom. All right, let's take a look at the images from your book. This first one is an interesting doorway. What do you want to say about this? So um, I'll read you the first two lines. From its name, you might expect a friar, but it's actually a venue you can hire. And you know that you are in Soulard. And the reason I included this is because when I'm giving a city tour to people from out of town, they always are asking, what is this? What is that? And this is one of the things that always gets asked about. So it's, it's kind of a, a fun, beautiful thing in the middle of a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We'll think about that one for a minute. Let's go to the next one. And this is some sort of hanging fish. I can't figure out what that really is. So I kind of expanded the city limits a little bit of Alton. Um, so that's a little bit of a clue. And if you know about the guy who drew all the cool birds, it's named after him. So, and I, I wanted to throw back to the fact we're on the Mississippi Flyway. We have over 500 species of birds that go up and down the, the waterway migrating. And, uh, you know, I actually live in Alton, so I should, I feel kind of bad that I don't know, I don't know this one. <laughs> well, it's kind of across the, the state border. Ah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Very good. Um, STL Scavenger is the name of the book. It's the ultimate search for St. Louis's hidden treasures. And this next one, now, who is this, I wonder? An onlooker, an Italian onlooker over the neighborhood of the hill. And oh, what... most people never see this because they see the awning. So that's another reason I chose it, because I wanted you to be across the street and looking up and kind of seeing what you're looking at. Do you ever hear that uh, somebody can't figure out any of these? Is that possible? It probably is possible, but that I was, it was vetted, right? The editorial staff at Reedy Press vetted it. They passed it around, and if they couldn't figure it out, they're like, okay, you, you need to go back to the drawing board. This one doesn't make sense. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I was vetted on this. And, and I had to, and my husband, my I call him my rhinoceros because we're fans of the Flight of the Concords. But he would say to me, he's like, you're not writing this for other tour guides and historical people in town. They already know the stuff. You're writing this to people who are from out of town or people who aren't from the neighborhood. Like, keep it simple, you know, keep it, keep it in the lines. You didn't listen to him, did you? <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> uh, this next uh, image from your book, one of the places that we're, we, you know, you're trying to get people to figure out where it is. It's, um, it's a, really a beautiful part of a building. And when you talk to Valerie, this would have been something, this will be something she may have in ready to wear as well. And this is a building I love to take my tourists to because when they renovated it, they found needles and they found spools of thread and bobbins and everything because this is in downtown. Yeah, well, Valerie Battle Kinzel, who you just mentioned, is up in the next segment about her book, Ready to Wear. So don't tell me if I'm right, but that must mean that's on Washington Avenue but don't say 99.8% sure. <laughs> <laughs> this next image from your book, these are some beautiful windows. Well, and it's, it's on, again, you're on the edge of a neighborhood, um, but it, it is the oldest, oldest brick farmhouse. So that would, that should help you a little bit when you're out looking around uh, that area of town. And do you have a rhyme with that one. I do. I do. Let me get that one for you. Because I love the whole rhyme concept. Do you? Good. I mean, it was. it's always kind of a, well, you know, do you do it? Do you not do it? You know, I'm not 100% sure if I should do it kind of thing, right? So you, you kind of hope that people, people fall into it. Well, if you don't have that one, that's fine. We'll just move on to the next image. I don't have that one right at my fingertips, unfortunately. Okay. I thought I did, but I don't. This, this next one I really like because whenever I see a cow on a ledge, I, it, it makes me laugh. I don't know why. 
it should make you laugh because it's pretty hilarious, right? I mean, that's that's a funny, funny thing to be seeing. And that is that is for the St. Louis people, it is across the river. And if you're you're at home, then then you know where I'm at. So we're in Edwardsville, all right, home of SIUE. And the rhyme is a little slice of carnivore heaven. They've been here since 1947. Hmm. I'm gonna have to work on that. <laughs> um, and you might have to go shopping. <laughs> Just real um, briefly, Dia, you own a couple of um, travel companies. Is that how you kind of got interested in this? Yes, I own Are We There Yet and Discover St. Louis Tours. And I cannot take credit for the idea of this book. Reedy Press was kicking it around. They thought this is a great thing to do during the pandemic. An individual can do it. Family can do it. People in your bubble. And they were trying to think of someone who could work on it. And my name got thrown out there, fortunately. And they called me and I didn't know what I was getting into. So I said, yes. Now, November 15th is a date people might want to write down because you're you're doing something online and that's the deadline. What's happening? So if you go to stlscavenger.com, you can upload your answers to all 366 clues. And if your answers are correct, your name will be thrown in with everyone else's name who got them correct. And then one will be drawn for a $500 prize that has been donated by Garcia Properties and the Dunn Department. And then if you don't win first place, there's a second and third prize with some other exciting gifts and swag. Dia, let's look at one more. This is a close-up of an eye. Yeah, so this was, this was someone who was very well known in City Hall, but it's actually in the Hill neighborhood. And so you will want to be going somewhere where you're recreating and that's where you will find this one. And there's a lot of really good stuff right around that area that a lot of people don't always get to when they come down to the hill. So I kind of wanted to lead them over to an area that's central to us, the folks that live here. Um, but it's not as central to people coming in, you know, and doing their shopping and stuff. Right. Well, Dia, so, we just touched the tip of the iceberg. How many, how many, how many did you say were in the book? 366. How long did it take you to do this? I started at the end of August and then we would kind of start and stop because we were having to coordinate the picture taking and the writing. And then it went, it, and it started as 15 neighborhoods. So we added on two more, then we added more than 20. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was pretty crazy, right? Right up until the very end in April. In the beginning well, it sounds like a fun book for people Not who April either live month. in St. Louis or people that have never been to, well, I guess you have to have been to St. Louis, but um, it'd be a fun thing to do with other people too, I think. It's from Reedy Press. It's STL Scavenger. Dia Hoover, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Uh, I love what you've done and keep having fun. Thank you so much. And Steve, I do want to say people who don't live here can do it. I wrote it so that you could use the clues in the internet because I figured people would be using their phones anyway. Thank you, Dia. And uh, we're going to come back and hear about how St. Louis was once the center of the fashion industry. More on City Corner right after this. story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. 
He wasn't trying to be mean. It just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day, I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Operation Wonder Park is a go! There's nothing more powerful than imagination. But don't just imagine. Use STEM to change the world. Who's with me? It's gonna hurt tomorrow. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. There are so many reasons to love St. Louis, you can't pick just one. What I love about St. Louis is the 79 unique neighborhoods and 108 beautiful city parks, including Forest Park, which is actually larger than Central Park in New York, and the gorgeous Tower Grove Park right here. And there's always something new to experience, no matter the time of day or the season. So come and experience St. Louis. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. Uh, today we're talking about a couple of books that deal with St. Louis and its history and places and things like that. And did you know that St. Louis was once where retailers from New York came to buy dresses and footwear? It was a famous place for fashion. And you may not be aware of that, but our next guest is Valerie Battle-Kinzel has the book, Ready to Wear. Hi, Valerie. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, of course, fashion isn't something I know much about, but I bet there are a lot of people, I knew a little bit about the fashion history of St. Louis, but I suspect you talked to a lot of people that it's kind of a surprise. Yes, I did. Um, this has not been addressed as much um, in publications a lot of people don't know about it unless maybe they had a relative or somebody they knew that had worked in the industry back when it was uh, in full throttle back in the 20th century. You know, I'm wondering if there's a connection between, um, and maybe this is my own head, St. Louis was founded in 17, whatever it was. 64. A, okay, thank you. As a fur trading post, did that have anything to do with the making of clothing later? Absolutely. It evolved from a fur trading post to it was located in the central part of the United States. It was along the Mississippi River, which was the super highway of the 19th century. And it just evolved kind of naturally. The, um, the furs, the leather, everything was coming through here, cotton, wool, and the supplies were right here in the center of the United States. And of course, at one time, I think when when what you're all you're saying is true about St. Louis being a fashion center, uh, back then uh, St. Louis was like the fourth largest uh, city in the United States. So that had something yes, to do with it, I guess. Yes, it was. Yes, so we were very fashion forward. Uh huh. Well, um, yeah, where did you come up for the idea with this book, and why? Okay, my husband is a third generation shoe man. Uh, he's in occupational footwear. I have lived in St. Louis for 40 years and constantly heard about International Shoe Company, which is where he used to go pick up his shoes. The building where he once picked up shoes is now City Museum. And his father and grandfather and great-grandfather were also employees of International Shoe Company. Now, today, my son and son-in-law are part of this family business. So, I had heard so much about shoes. I'm a history nerd and I just started digging and ended up going down one rabbit hole and another and finding more information. I pitched it to Reedy Press and they said, see what you can come up with. And I did. Hmm. Uh, well, let's take a look at some images from your book, Ready to Wear. And this, we'll start with this, an old uh, ad. And uh, this sounds like something my grandmother was, would have told me about how you know good shoes are good for your health. Yes. Okay. Well, Buster Brown concept was uh, used by George Warren Brown. He, uh, at the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, the World's Fair, he secured the rights to use a cartoon character by a man named Richard Outcult. And the character was Buster Brown. He was a very popular comic. And Buster Brown had a dog named Tyke. Well, 
he secured the services, he decided it would be really fun to have a road show that would take Buster Brown around the country on a train with a real dog. And um, this is very popular, very popular advertising form. Brought in kids, every city they went to, the kids came running, they pulled their parents along, and then they wanted the parents to buy Buster Brown shoes because Buster Brown was a really cool kid. When did they stop making those? I almost seem to, did I just see the ads? Or I seem to remember those as being real shoes in my lifetime. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. 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 You Seems may like have even just... worn a pair. Who knows, right? Yeah. I probably have some at home in the back of the closet. Uh, this next image from your book is um, a very pretty dress. And who is this Vera Hicks? Vera Hicks was a designer in St. Louis. Uh, she had uh, a location down in, I think it was on McPherson in the Central West End. She had a high-end shop and she was just really ahead of her time. She really brought a lot of the, uh, the design innovations to St. Louis in the industry. And at that point, uh, the mid 20th century, people were coming from Los Angeles and from New York to St. Louis twice a year to buy and take back to the coast uh, the styles from St. Louis designers. Huh. You know, back, back when all this was going on in St. Louis, did this uh, make a lot of St. Louis people rich? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, George Warren Brown, who was the founder of Brown Shoe Company, which is now Calaris, he lived next door to a man named Oscar Johnson, who was the head of Roberts Johnson Rand Shoe Company. They lived in Portland Place. They had these beautiful mansions, and although they were, they were competitors during the day, they were actually said to be very cordial at home in the neighborhood. Mm. I guess I could afford to be cordial. Yes. <laughs> um, speaking of gentlemen, here is an image of some uh, very fashionable gentlemen. What's the story here? Uh, just um, these were called fashion plates. They were used, they were very popular in the 19th century before color photography. They uh, showed these very dapper gentlemen. Men as well as women uh, have long been fashion conscious as far as their shoes, their clothing, the length of their suit coats, the length of their pants, their neckwear, especially their hats in the 19th century. Hats were a huge thing for gentlemen. Yeah, I remember as a kid, like when I was young, which was a long time ago, when I was a little kid, like everybody's dad and granddad wore a hat. Absolutely, mine too. Yeah, those days are gone, I think. This next image, this is not an old image, this is a new one. Who are these people? Which one is this? Remind me again. This is the, um, the inaugural class. Oh yes, of the St. Louis Fashion Fund. Right. Yes, that started in St. Louis. It was to bring interest back into the city for seamsters, seamstresses, creators, uh, shoe, personalized shoe production people, jewelers. And um, it was brought here as an incubator to try to regenerate, get some young, fresh ideas. And it came to St. Louis in 2014. And it is still going today very successful. In fact, if I could put a plug in here, if, um, if you order the book from a website that's www.stlfashionbook.com, you can purchase this book and 25% of the proceeds will go to the St. Louis Fashion Fund. Very good. Hey, this next image, um, this is a crowded Washington Avenue and uh, I feel for that. My, my family uh, 100 years ago had a business down right down there. It wasn't a fashion business, so it was a supply company. But uh, talk about the streetscape. Okay, um, from people I talked to in writing the book, I talked to grandchildren and people who had known people that worked down there during the height of the garment district years. And they said the street literally buzzed and hummed with activity. There were so many people on the streets. The windows were open. You could hear the whirring and the, the machines, the sewing machines, and said it was just an unbelievably noisy and lively place to be at that time. Sewing machines, you bring back another memory. I remember when all my friend's mom sewed. I don't know anyone that sews anymore, do you? Maybe one person. <laughs> Would that be you? 
Yes. <laughs> That's what I figured. Uh, let's take a look at this next shot um, from your book, Ready to Wear. And here we have some kind of classy debutantes. Yes, uh, the Veil Prophet Ball, always a, a very popular thing in St. Louis in the 20th century, especially. Um, at one time, there was a gentleman named Mr. Harbison with the emphasis on Mr. And he designed many of the ball gowns that were worn by uh, Veil Prophet Queens in the mid 20th century. Lots of production. High, high class stuff there. Yes. Now this next image would go kind of behind the scenes and uh, these people look hard at work. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, stitching and cutting. Um, it was determined as the 20th century developed that it was more time efficient to have people work on the same production step all day, every day, instead of trying to make a, a garment from scratch and go through all the different steps. So somebody might say, for example, sew in the tongues of a shoe or sew the sleeves on a dress. And that's what they would do every day, eight hours a day. Wow. I, I'm just guessing those were not high paying jobs. No, they were not. No, they were not. Figures. <laughs> this next shot it goes back to the 1930s. And uh, we were talking about animal fur earlier and St. Louis being a fur trading post and all that. Is that an animal fur I see? Yes, it is. Um, at one time, there was a school down in the city called Hadley. It was an industrial training school. And they had a class that taught their students how to look and to grade qualities of fur. St. Louis had been, since 1764, a big fur trading place. And at that time, there were still many, many warehouses, which were actually on where the uh, the Gateway Arch grounds are now. There were many fur warehouses and you would go, if you traded in furs, you would grade them and rate them on their texture, their quality, their thickness, um, their nap. And that's what these people were learning to do was to grade furs. Uh, uh, this next one, if, if I didn't know, I would not know that this is a photograph of an old shoe factory. Yes. Um, Lots of noise, lots of production, lots of dirt. Um, at this time, before OSHA standards, um, you know, if you happen to lose a finger or get injured, um, I guess it wasn't that big a deal. There was always somebody else there to take their place. There were lots of people that wanted to work in this industry. Hmm. Well, Valerie, the book is ready to wear. And it's just out, as a matter of fact, takes a look at the footwear and garment industry in St. Louis. And as you point out, at one time, St. Louis is where retailers from New York City would come to buy fashion and take it back and sell to all, sell to all those East Coasters. So it's uh, always great to talk to you. Anything in the works coming up? Um, this is enough for right now. But yes, I have another one in the works for next year. Yeah. All right, well, I'll talk to you next year then, okay. Valerie, ba Valerie Battle Kinzel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Take ready care. to wear, ready to wear is the book. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thanks for joining us for City Corner. I'm Steve Potter. See you next time. Bye.